Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Genesis Blog podcast. Uh, today we're going to re re uh, re look at another thematic analysis we had done before, which is the decentralized social media narrative. Um, we did this uh, article in conjunction with Frogs Anonymous, uh, one of our longtime collaborators, uh, and the article was authored by Sid, who's also going to lead the podcast today. So, without further ado, take it away, Sid. Thanks, Yash. Um, so, as Yash mentioned, we have previously looked at uh, Web three social. So, uh, uh, some of the material um, will be a bit uh, repetitive, um, but uh, to save time, I'll just quickly, you know, uh, brief over those items, and then we can spend slightly more time on the new, the new information, right? Um, so with that, let me begin. Um, I mean, so just a little bit background about you know social media as a industry before getting into the Web three specifics. Um, as of November twenty twenty two, you know there there are just above four point five billion users. Um, of social media worldwide, with each um, spending an average two and a half hours daily, right? Um, in addition, social media applications such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, you know, the behemoths, the usual suspects, um, have disrupted businesses. Um, how, I should say how business is done in several industries, right? Entire business models have been both and have become ubiquitous um, in our daily lives. Right. Um, and of course, um, this has provided us with a lot of value um, in various uh, ways, but that it has also come at costs. This is all to say that social media is huge. Um, it's everywhere. Um, it provides value, but also it has costs and we mustn't um, ignore those costs and we mustn't strive to, you know, solve them, solve those problems. Um, uh, now, going into a bit of the, um, you know, fundamentals of social media as it is today, um, essentially, the owners of the content and data that we, you know, that we, that we create and we consume are owned by the social media companies, right? Um, and therefore, the value um, accrues to the platform, to the company, and not by, not to the consumers or creators. Um, and this is because of the well-known advertisement driven model right um a good uh, you know a good uh, a good analogy or a good mental model um is presented by chris dixon right uh, he says that and which, which is now you know uh, generally accepted that aggregation platforms uh, made the social media or other types of aggregation platforms um such as you know marketplaces or or specifically could be airbnb or whatever first attract users with free services um, which allows the network to, you know, create network effects. Um, and once, and, and in this initial phase, the attraction of customers is done by making it seem, and in, in, it, it, it is done by the, you know, users to experience a friction-free process to join the network and experience the network. But then over time, um, after a critical mass has been reached, um, then the platforms are extracting value from their users. And now over here, the fiction is has become an illusion. Um, there is no friction still when joining, but then the friction is postponed to a later point in time. Um, this is done by you know collecting data on users and then selling them to uh, companies who then use that data to advertise back to the users, right? Um, and since the network owners Right. And in our context, the social media companies have access to an ownership of this large volumes of data. Um, they command a significant leverage um, amongst all the industry stakeholders. Right. And all this is all of this is an is a huge issue because um, right, in number one, it disincentivizes innovation. Um, because it makes it almost impossible for new um applications to, you know, uh to, be, to hit the mainstream, you can create a new application, but then because of uh, the core start problem, which is, you know, attracting a first cohort of users and kickstart the network effect, because you can't do that uh, because you don't have the content and, and all the contents on another platform. Um, it, it, it 
just disincentivizes people to create social media applications and new features. Um, and of course, because of the large incumbents already, you know, um, they already have a functioning application, a thriving business. They're not incentivized to create new features um, as much as startups are. And beyond beyond innovation, um, you know, privacy issues are a huge concern. Um, you know, Cambridge Analytica is probably the poster boy um, of this point. Um, and in addition, um, it makes this whole system essentially makes um, these applications like walled gardens, right? Uh, and that causes a lack of composability um, in, inherent to all of social media. And then that just makes it, you know, very um, difficult for creators to uh, create content again and again, the same content in many situations across platforms, and then also are in, unable to leverage their audience. They've already built, basically leverage all the time they've already spent on one platform onto another platform, right? Um, so all of this is, these are the issues, the, at least I should say the first order issues. Um, the second order issues, issues include such as, you know, deep platforming, censorship, um, echo chambers, um, uh, which are all, you know, nuanced issues that uh, have become pretty evident in recent times um, for users and creators alike. Um, and so to sum up, you can see that we're stuck in a loop, right? Um, users have to use these companies' uh, application, these social media applications, because they have monopoly on the content, um, forcing creators to give their content up to them in order to get the reach uh, because users are there. And in a vicious cycle that continues to empower these companies at the expense of creators and, um, you know, I, sh I should say society as a whole, right? Um, so, so, you know, these companies have managed to create a global network effect now at this point, right? 4.5 billion um, users, uh, which is half the world um, and, and growing um, around a private pool of content, right? That they monopolize. And while there is benefits of having this, you know, this um, global pool of content, definitely, because then, you know, curation, for example, um, becomes easier. Um, but the issue is that this global pool needs, in, in our current system, needs a gatekeeper. Um, and whoever this gatekeeper is, then naturally, um, you know, uh, is granted disproportionate leverage over, over value, over everything, right? Over control, over what information um, is deemed worthy to be consumed. Um, so, which is a fundamental right, right? Um, so, now a solution would be to make a public pool, a public global pool of content, right? Um, that is the, um, you know, North Star problem, if you will. Um, and that's exactly what Web3 is trying to solve, right? Um, so, in other words, Web3 Social is trying to make a system of social media where all stakeholders, right? The creators, the users, the platforms, um, form a more mutual beneficial relationship um, and make the presence of a, you know, highly extractive middleman obsolete, right? Um, that is what, at a very fundamental level, Web3 social is trying to architect, right? Um, closed databases, opaque algorithms become open networks where users and creators own their data and there are transparent free market dynamics in, in the, algorithm for, for one and second, the application feature development, right? Um, those two will, uh, you know, make the user experience um, a lot more better and the progress, the, the improvement of this experience that much faster, right? Um, so to understand this, I'll jump into, um, you know, a slightly, uh, a most slightly granular detail of you know, how the social media stack is, like what are the categorizations right, of the social media stack? Um, this, so at the, at the base layer, um, think of it as the data layer, right? Then above it is the social media, social primitive layer. Um, above that is the algorithm layer and then on the top is the front end layer. So what does, you know, each of these mean um, briefly? So data layer is nothing but what you'd expect. It's where the data is stored, the individual, um, you know, uh, let's say if you upload a video, this is where the video would be stored. Um, then the layer above the social primitive layer is what we call as the social graph. This, um, to understand it, a good way to understand this is, um, it makes sense of all these individual pieces of data. 
so it connects all these data um to you know so it's so it's meaningful for example you know if you have um if you as an as a user likes some content uh, posts some content so the social graph layer will, will connect all these all these instances and then be able to say okay you know you are this unique individual you have these likes these posts and these people have liked your post etc cetera, etc cetera. um then on top of that is the algorithm layer as i mentioned this what this does is is basically um it aids in curation right um so it 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 learns from the social graph the social primitive layer and then uh, tries to you know uh, it tries to use that the the existing information to present content um to you know users in a way that the user will most likely like that content right um and of course this is uh done by you know uh, it's an iterative process um the users from the front end layer now I'm jumping to the last the top most layer the front end layer which is the application itself which you and I interact with um so the users can you know provide feedback on what they like and then the, the algorithm the algorithm layer learns and therefore you know um, evolves and develops into something that hopefully curates better so these four categories are what makes up um the social media stack um and for us in the context of social the most important layer is the uh social graph layer the data layer um as a slight tangent is uh definitely more fundamental and that is more more a, a problem what web3 as a whole is trying to solve but if we focus more on web3 social then it is the social graph layer that is what um we must focus on right um so like i mentioned uh most critical is the social graph um so in the context of 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 blockchain a graph is like an indexing protocol now what does that mean right um very simply um an indexing protocol makes um data querying easier so now what does that mean it's basically when you're trying to find a particular piece of information um you can you either have you know you can either do it the old school way or i should say you know the brute force way which is you look at every single you know the your whole database of information and look for just one by one uh, try to find the one piece of information that you want um or you can you know employ a, a something like a social graph which is uh, an analogous to an index of a book right in the beginning of a book you have an index which says you know uh, chapter 1 say page number 1 and then chapter 2 page number 7 so you know directly where to jump to right say if you want to go to chapter 2 you know okay page 1 to 6 is useless to me just go to, go jump to jump number 7 page number 7 and you're there right so this makes it faster to find what you're looking for and that's what a social graph does essentially right um it, it graphs it brings order structure and connections to data in a way that makes it easier and quicker to query and find the specific information you need right um it's a data structure social graph it's it's useful to think of it as a data structure that collectively refers to the global mapping of all users their connections and their interactions and behaviors towards each other right um it is the aggregate of you know of what we spoke about earlier which is likes follows comments posts etc etc right that so this is what at a very fundamental level a social graph is right and if i can just uh, jump in sorry sure. um just wanted to like simplify the web3 social stack so that you know i get some context and give the viewers Definitely. some context the four layers if i could just dumb it down a little the data layer is like the content layer so whatever content is created that is stored in the data layer that is what people interact with which and from that comes the social primitive or social graph layer this layer is essentially a collection of a users interaction with other users and specific content so it's the social graph layer is interacting with the data layer and those interactions are stored on the social graph layer as a specific user social graph and then there's also a global social graph which is all the users combined so it's like if instagram twitter facebook all these different social media companies all aggregated their data and uh, open sourced their data for anyone to use that would that would what that, that is what this layer would look like and then the algorithm layer is obviously similar to what social media companies do but again it's open source so that everyone knows what the algorithm is and it can't just be 
changed according to the whims of this social media giant. The way you know Twitter changes its algorithm on the daily now it seems. And then finally is the front end layer, which uh you know unlike traditional social media, the front end layer actually becomes the most irrelevant and the hardest to create a moat in because it's the data that people really care about and they don't uh care what front end they access it from. So front ends will become more like you could say extensions or tools where you select the front end that you like the most, but you're still accessing that same pool of content and you're still doing it through that global data graph, which means that value theoretically should accrue to base layers instead of front ends. And it would be in a way tougher to create network effects for a single app. And it's the protocols that allow people to create social graphs that will start accruing value in the future. So it's again the FAT protocol thesis by, you know, A16Z and Chris Dixon, but just for social media. Yeah, absolutely. I definitely think, um, you know, what you're saying is right in the sense that value accrual is now going to move towards the more, um, the you know, the lower level. Um, one thing I'll add is personally, I'm still not convinced or I don't have conviction where more value, even though I think value will flow in the curation layer, the algorithm layer, and the social graph layer, data layer, of course. Um, but that's a broader discussion of you know blockchains and whatnot. Um, but from the two graph and algorithm, I'm still not sure the dynamic of which is going to get more uh, more value. But you're right. I think we know for sure, certain that at least the front ends are going to be definitely commoditized to a large, large, much greater degree. Um, so, so yeah, with that, um, let's tie what, what we just spoke about, right? So, which is the, um, what a social graph is to, um, what a social graph is to what web three, how web three trying to solve it, right? Um, solve for this. Um, and I think what you said right now is, is a good, is a good segue, which is, Imagine Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and if they open sourced all of their personal so social graphs, right? Um, or, or, or their, uh, the data that they have, um, that would be a, essentially a public, a, a public pool of content on which then social graphs can be built on. Um, and so right now with each of them in their own walled gardens, um, all the, the networks, what they do is they read and own the user data from their own central central databases, right? There's no portability um, between social uh, social media networks. Um, and this causes each network to fight a zero-sum game, essentially, right? Um, for uh, uh, zero-sum game for your attention, right? Um, and Web3 Social, like I mentioned, is trying to make this essentially permissionless. Um, um, make this Web3 social protocols aim to create permissionless systems, like I mentioned, where users own and control their data while maintaining a unified social graph. Exactly uh, what these are basically what we just said in different words, right? Um, and on the on the flip side, this what we mentioned the user side, and on the developer side, um, this the the benefits continue, right? Which is um, they they can essentially you know permissionlessly one uh, access this data and develop applications. Um, and at the same time, they, they, they don't run the risk of being, um, banned, um, uh, arbitrarily. Right. So one a famous example is Twitter, uh, in the early days, and even Facebook for that matter, um, in the early days, they had the APIs open uh, publicly for developers. And then just randomly when, you know, the, when the network grew, uh, sufficiently, they just blocked those APIs and, you know, uh, something that I related to personally was uh, all those games on Facebook, uh, like Farmville. Um, which, you know, now does not exist because, uh, Facebook shut those APIs. Um, this issue would not have happened in a web three social media world. Um, right. Um, and, and all of this put together, um, essentially, you know, uh, uh, gives rise to, um, some, Yash, what you mentioned, which is the competitive landscape now is very different. Um, right. Uh, social media platforms don't, the main issue for social media platforms when they start is no longer the cold start problem because they all have access to the same um, content. Um, and, and another way to think about this is imagine you going on an, on a web three social media application for the first time, but the experience is like you always using it, right? There's no difference in uh, experience 
um, from the beginning to you know say a year later, um, at least from the curation of content standpoint. Um, so so, and, and of course, like I said, um, developers can freely build as well. Um, so users are not a moat uh, anymore. Feature and curation algorithm developments become uh, feature and uh, feature and curation algorithms uh, become the moat for an application uh, itself, not the protocol. The protocol uh, at the protocol level, we're still to see, you know, like how it will pan out. Will there be one one global social media protocol, or will there be two or three? That that is still to be seen. But at least from a user application standpoint. The users are not a moat anymore. It is the ability to create new features, useful features, and then you know developing um, an algorithm that that does what it says, right? Um, so, so right. So with with all this background, um, let's jump into the current landscape of Web three social, right? Before you do that, Yash, do you have any other points? Any questions? No, I'm just interested to see what the current developments are in the Web3 space. I read of a few, uh, but not completely dive deep into it to understand how they work intricately. So let's go for it. Sure, sure. Um, so to begin, um, let's just uh, briefly go over the four key problems that must be solved for you know a decentralized social protocol. Um, I won't get too technical. Uh, but broadly speaking, number one is identity, which is ability to issue a decentralized identity, right? Which is a mix of unique and non-unique identifiers. Unique could be a username, non-unique could be something like a profile picture, right? Um, so a collection of these that is mapped and owned and controlled um, to a real world entity, which is, you know, for example, you. Um, so number two is authentication. Um, all data that is generated by user is verifiably untampered. Um, I mean, this is self-explanatory why this is uh, needed. Um, number three is availability. Ensuring data is accessible between applications um, while maintaining reasonable constraints on the size and volume of data such that the data can be realistic, realistically indexed. So this is a, a, a novel need for Web3 for web social versus um, web, web2 social. Right, um, because this is what allows for this public pool of content to be leveraged uh, by various applications. Um, and of course, like I said, like I mentioned at the end, this has to be done while maintaining constraints on um, you know data size and volume, because then it just technologically won't be feasible practically. Um, and lastly, number four is consistency. Right, ensuring all user activity recorded is done so consistently. Um, as conflicting data can emerge due to use of several clients writing data to the same database. So this again is a novel issue. Uh, while consistency is an issue even in Web two social, this becomes a greater. Uh, it becomes more important in Web three social because you have, um, you know, multiple clients uh, writing to the same uh, database um, in Web three social. So this is an is a more it, it's it's an important more important consideration uh, in this world. Um, now, given this these four points. Each protocol that we're going to discuss now, essentially, are trying to solve for this these issues, and each have their own nuanced way. Uh, we won't get into how exactly each of them will be doing because that that's a much more technical discussion, well out of the scope. Um, but this is a good, you know, high level understanding of what Web three is trying to achieve. Um, so with that, let's jump into individual protocols. Uh, number one, we have Lens, right? Um, Lens launched in early twenty twenty two. Um, it was the first social graph protocol I learned about, um, and it's built upon po uh, a Polygon on the Polygon blockchain. Um, and also interestingly, it is it's built by the founder of Aave, um, by the Aave team. Um, and Aave, uh, for for the audience who for audience members who are not aware, is uh, one of the you know original um, uh, DeFi protocols uh, in the borrowing and lending space. So the team is you know. Uh, a well season. Um, now, like I mentioned, it's a social graph protocol. So essentially, um, they're trying to create this, you know, underlying social primitive on top of which uh, various applications can be built. Um, and I mean, that's essentially what they're trying to do. Uh, I'll jump into the stats now of uh, of Lens specifically. Um, they have 
seen a significant drop off um, in in new user growth at least. Um, in June 2022, they had new new profile creations at 22,000. 22, um, and in as of Feb 23, it's hit less than 4,000. Um, this could be um, you know uh, indicative of the broader crypto um, crypto slowdown as we've seen. But in contrast, in the last in the six months from August 22 to February 2023, um, Lens actually witnessed the 200% growth in monthly active users from 17k to 60,000. Um, so this is quite uh, commendable, given you know the broader slowdown that I just mentioned. Um, now it's difficult to get exact details of which um, you know which which uh, front-end application on Lens is driving this, um, but noteworthy applications are Lenster, Favo, and Orb on Lens. Um, and Lenster definitely um, is the, out of the three, the one with the most traction. It was the original application uh, built on Lens um, and still retains definitely a disproportionate uh, usage. Um, so you have, so Lens, like I mentioned, offers um, short form text, image, video, audio, so your standard social features. It hasn't, however, launched any tokens. So that makes the traction all the more commendable, right? Because it's organic and feature driven as opposed to with tokens. Um, going to favor talking about tokens, <coughs> excuse me, um, they are a mobile based application with again, once again, all standard social features, but um, they, however, have launched a token um, and they def and their token model in at a very high level is essentially they allow betting. They've leveraged the gambling instinct um, to, you know, uh, to gain traction and essentially users can bet on posts by locking tokens um, and, you know, whichever does well, then yields back to the person who bet, right? And similarly, creators can bet on other posts or their own posts. Um, so this is a novel token model that they've implemented and have got a decent amount of track, uh, attraction um, on, on the Lens protocol. Um, lastly, we have Orb. Orb is a mobile-based application that started off as, you know, a LinkedIn for Web3, but now I believe, to the best of my knowledge, have pivoted to a more generalized social media platform. And they take third place in terms of traction. Um, and while there's no significant differentiation that I could find, they have a very, you know, mobile friendly and intuitive UX. Um, so that could be a reason why they've been able to get that much traction or any traction, I should say. Um, so yeah, overall Lens is built from the ground up with modularity in mind. Um, and to, to our understanding, the two unlock for Lens will happen when all of its core features, um, which is, uh, you know, all core features uh, pivot to, or I should say evolve into being an NFT, which is how they have, um, that's the goal. They want every single, you know, uh, instance. So a like, comment, uh, po uh, post, um, every single social uh, feature uh, or social primitive, want, they want to make it as an NFT. Uh, and when this is all abstracted away, um, you know, where users don't have to worry about it being an NFT or not, um, that's when uh, we believe, you know, Lens could um, start you know, uh, get their hockey stick growth. Um, so that's, that's lens. Um, next let's move on to, uh, before we move on, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, three things about lens. So first one, the user growth is kind of stunted because, uh, the developers haven't really opened it up to the public yet. Um, so there was like a limited access, uh, NFT mint that was allowed. The NFT mint was essentially like a. ID, like similar to an ENS name, uh, but just the lens name instead. Uh, and now the only way to get a lens uh, ID is to either buy an NFT on OpenSea or you need to do certain activities on the Favor app and then you may qualify for uh, the weekly NFT drops that they kind of do. I don't know if it's weekly or monthly, but basically they allow uh, people who... Uh, you know, had a significant amount of activity on favor and done certain tasks, they get a chance to mint an NFT. So I think they're doing this right now because they're still in development. 
and only uh, and you know let the protocols also occur, like like you said controlled by a multi sig so i think uh, they would open it up to the public around the same time they decentralize the multi sig into a dao using a token that would make the most sense to me uh, you know at the same to, like you know to build up the hype also kind of launch the token and make the protocol go public at the same time that could really make it explode and i think they're scared of you know releasing the protocol too early and it not getting enough traction and dying down because they're competing against these social media behemoths um and the second thing uh, about lenses that because it's the rv team that's uh, developing it the rv team has hinted that they want to integrate lens protocol with rv and other borrowing protocols and create a kind of on chain social score which can enable a uh, better lending and borrowing efficiency by allowing people to take out maybe under collateralized loans if their you know social so, social score is good enough and kind of integrate identity using social media protocols with lending and borrowing which would be a great merge of these two technologies and allow on chain identity as well as lending and borrowing to flourish which is what defi de- desperately needs because currently it's way more capital inefficient compared to normal banks which can lend out obviously under collateralized because that's how the current banking system works so i mean they've already thought about it and i mean i've not read up too much about other protocols lens is what i've read about most but they do seem the most promising currently yeah absolutely i i i think they were also the first to market even though it was um you know a, a closed launch uh, but yeah i, th- no, I, I think, think so and bit connect or bit connect. whatever the other one was they they went live earlier uh, but those okay. didn't get any traction at all so right right cool um i mean with that let's jump into the to what you know um i believe is lens's biggest com- com- competitor as of now which is farcaster um farcaster um uh, you know like you would imagine is another social graph protocol so the exact same you know uh, as as lens in the sense that they want to enable applications to be built on top of them um so the first client however um on lens on oh, sorry on farcaster is being developed by the same farcaster protocol team so a good way to think about it is whereas lens the lens team has you know built the protocol and focusing on the protocol growth um from just trying to you know uh, uh, encourage use uh, developers mm-hmm. to build on top of them um farcaster are trying to build the application and the protocol themselves and the uh, and and uh, and i think and uh, i mean the understanding is that they believe that that's the best way to um you know get that uh, traction and get and best way to encourage developer other developers to start building on top of farcaster um because at the end that's the goal for any social graph protocol um so yeah so farcaster uh their the app, the um you know, the application that's being developed by them is also known as farcaster and is more similar to twitter um so you can you know think about you know tweets retweets posts so on and so forth um in terms of traction the cumulative user base for farcaster is around 11000 um with as of at least march 23 the protocol had 3 and 3, around 3.3 um k monthly active users um on the protocol today the protocol has around 30 clients uh, which are under development um and you can you know have exact you can look at the exact list on the article um but their go as as mentioned by their founder that the their go to market strategy is specifically to focus on crypto native users and not worry about the mainstream they want to force you know uh target that pool and then and specifically exploit the fact that twitter and other such um, you know mediums which have a, which were today crypto natives uh, uh, operate on um they want to solve their pain points by integrating on chain activity and what not um and then think about the mainstream later um so i mean by far the most used protocol uh, application farcaster is the farcaster application itself um so there's not much to talk about um with the others so um that's number 2 number 3 is cyberconnect 
um yeah so like you mentioned you're right cyberconnect launched earlier earlier than lens cyberconnect launched in um late 2021 um and they are like uh, are once again another social graph protocol um they have they, they've taken a more uh, you know um multi chain uh, approach uh, as as opposed to say lens who's focusing more on polygon at the moment um so cyberconnect currently exists on ethereum solana bnb chain um and polygon and want they want to cater to all evm compatible blockchains in the short term in the intermediate term um so again very similar they essentially a social graph protocol one interesting development is um they also launched a product um called link3 uh which is very similar to what a link link3 is um so like a static website which just links essentially that point to different locations on uh, on the web um and so with that product uh, out the cyber connect team claims the protocol claims to have 30 applications utilizing their protocol with a total cumulative user count of 750000 um with and out of that um the uh, dau is around 75000 um which is quite substantial and this is numbers as of uh, march late march 2023 right um so i mean right off the bat this is quite shocking um compared to say farcast who has 3.3k uh, 3 and 1/2000 monthly active users and you know lens who has um around 60000 uh 60000 yeah 60000 so i mean the the one way to think about this traction is um you know if and we is because one one reason to to really question this traction is because we're not really sure what they define as active users um if it if it's just you know one link click on a link 3 site um if they consider that as an active user um you know it may not represent full reality of the social protocol itself um but nonetheless um you know even 1000 users in this market is uh, worth noting um so that's that's cyber connect and that's link link 3 is definitely their um current uh, you know leader in terms of what applications are being used on their protocol um so lastly the last protocol we talked about is deso uh, uh deso is short for decentralized social um so they've gone in a slightly different angle which is they've also decided to to um you know uh, build the blockchain the underlying blockchain and then uh and you know start from a, a, a lower level than the other three that we just mentioned which are just the social graphs um deso has launched has raised a lot of money north of 200 million dollars from very well reputed investors such as sequoia pantera coinbase c16z and the list goes on um and but but the goal is the same um is that they want to you know enable seamless storage and indexing for data rich applications uh like social media uh social media applications and um you know once on chain then various companies can run their own front end uh front front their own front ends um similar to how even say lens or farcast are trying to do they don't also allow people to run their own front ends um so in that sense they are similar um but and, and once again you know uh, the outcome is the same in the sense that you have access permissionless access to data um you know permission access to build on top of it on, on top of the blockchain um and create social media applications so like you don't expect this however even though it's a blockchain is specialized for the social media use case um another another uh, point in point noting this they have launched their their native token their native coin which is deso deso um and it's already launched and publicly tradable uh, traded um and which you can do on coinbase and a few other exchanges um the pro- the primary function uh to my best understanding is to maintain security of the blockchain and incentivize you know uh, users um uh, so i mean they not i couldn't find any specific mention of what the tokens used for but this is the best guess based on all the material available i can um, just and- i can summarize d so uh it's a short oh. point it's pretty <laughs> it has no real utility uh it was i think it was created at a time when people weren't sure about value accrual dynamics and tokens and that wasn't really a priority uh, because tokenization itself was so novel 
and people are still experimenting and i think they haven't pivoted enough and you know better their model i think they're kind of stagnating raised a lot of money but have got no traction in like three or four years now um mm. so definitely i would not bet on deso getting any mass adoption even though they're backed by such a well renowned investors and vc funds i think lens and forecast are far ahead and are way more in tune with the uh you know web3 zeitgeist as compared to something like deso which just seems like a vc cash grab and we've seen many mm. of those especially when it comes to layer ones um so yeah i'm not a big fan of deso yeah um i mean one one uh, one data point i found was from the you know the block explorer if you will called open prospero um as per uh, as per that uh, website um deso has 2 million um wallets and 1 million creators which are defined as wallets with a username um yeah. and, and on top of which um the transaction on the blockchains on the blockchain itself um has grown to 87 million cumulative um from it being 150000 in march 2021 so over the course of say 2 years um i mean not much to read into that but i mean it seems to be if if this if this blockchain explorer is block explorer is you know sound it seems like there is some traction if not you know if it's not dead um if you look under the hood um so yeah i mean not again not much like you say like you said on this um on this particular blockchain if some if people are interested there are a few applications you can check out there's diamond um story with story with an i nfts dao dao and a few others um but yeah there's a lot of op- definitely a lot of opacity in this particular blockchain um so proceed with caution um so yeah that's that's the that's a few um, noteworthy uh, social applications for because um there are definitely a lot more um over the last one year tons and tons have popped up you know including mines dq peer chingari iris interface social x and there are a whole bunch more um so you know a uh, lot more to come from uh this space and you know some are trying to recreate existing web web2 services and while others are trying to create novel web3 um social uh, you know uh, features altogether um and with that you know comes to uh, uh let's let's conclude this episode um web3 social as a whole is you know is in its infancy um that's also understating it to be honest uh we're looking at you know m- numbers of sub 100000 monthly users compared to multi billion on web2 social media so the comparison is quite hilarious at this at this stage um but like i mentioned uh there's been like a campaign explosion of web3 social apps and you know we cannot have demand without supply so with that with that with the supply starting um you know who knows when the exponential hockey stick starts um and you know um it's it's logical to assume that as we know as emerge um from web3 social uh, we could expect a large and larger web2 social users switching over to web3 uh, however timelines as always are uh, you know unpredictable um however there are a few critical problems that without which solve uh, we should not expect any of this to happen um number one is just you know ui ux i think we can both say from experience that the ui ux across web3 let alone social is quite sad um so this number one has to be solved uh, including you know being smartphone first because that's where most of the world uses um uh, social media um second is unscaled infrastructure so this is just from a pragmatic you know technological standpoint facebook alone you know every minute generates five like half a million comments um you know 4 million posts are liked so the 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 pace of data generation is just massive um and in current in in the current uh Uh, up to you know web3 reels cannot handle this kind of traffic blockchains the throughput is just not there um number 3 uh, you know stream of development so this goes back to what i mentioned at the end which is you know some applications are building web2 replicas and some are building um, you know web3 native or you know web3 novel uh, services and this is important because you know web2 users are not going to switch to web3 services if it's just for better privacy 
there has to be something that web two cannot like you know literally cannot compete with because of their fundamental web two approach first uh, web two first approach only then there will be an incentive for web three to uh, users to move to web three um so basically this is to say that web two replicas have to stop being built um that's not what's going to get the traction um and lastly token design token design uh, implementation of tokens is one thing that web three you know has an advantage over um or i should say is a, is a tool which is not on the tool belt the toolkit of web 2 um how it's implemented will determine if it's an advantage or not um favor is a good experiment it's a good way to start um but if if done right it can definitely kick start you know the um uh, the custom acquisition or user acquisition uh, to a much faster degree um so yeah so figuring out this token design is definitely one very important point so these are the four main problems that need to be solved um and with that yeah i think we come to the end of this particular episode. Yash, do you want to um, say a few things uh, before we wrap up? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, unlike DeFi, which has kind of captured crypto Twitter and, you know, the DGENs, if you will, something like Web3 Social or Web3 Gaming, those are uh, truly, you know, protocols and technology that could onboard the next billion users. Because DeFi, while, you know, it has seen, while it's seen a lot of innovation, in real life, there's not too many people managing their own money. Uh, they kind of delegate that uh, um, to other people who are more knowledgeable about the subject, which is why DeFi, I think, while having a, a big total addressable market will only be used by a certain number of people. It's not everyone will be who will be using DeFi, but something like Web3 Social, Web3 Gaming, those could truly be universal. And if implemented correctly, these are uh, the sectors where I think the next billion users will be onboarded to crypto. And to do that, obviously, we need to solve the four problems you mentioned above. And I hope you do. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. It'll be interesting to see next few years what happens. Um, yep. But yeah, with that, uh, guys, thank you for joining us uh, at uh, another episode and hope to see you all in the next one. Take care, guys. Peace. Thank you.